Okay, welcome everyone. The end folks arriving here. I am Jamie Strauss Clark. I am your facilitator, and today is our House Bill 1477 Crisis Response Improvement Strategy Steering Committee meeting. So as a reminder, this is uh, just the subset of CRIS members who um, participate on the steering committee. Our next CRIS, full CRIS committee meeting is going to be um, in about two weeks on Tuesday, June 20th. So not about two weeks, actually two weeks. Um, it's wonderful to see everyone. Uh, I'm going to ask our steering committee members shortly to introduce yourselves. But before I do, I'm just going to run in and uh, run through a few housekeeping items. So if you could advance the slide, please, Chloe. I know many of you have seen these slides many times and are probably tired of them, but I'm going to I'm going to go through them another time. Um, I have two slides here on how we use the Zoom technology, one for our steering committee members and one for our um, community members and guests who are joining us today. So this is the one for the steering committee members. Cool. If you could just advance the there we go. Um, so steering committee members and also staff who are joining us today, if you could keep your mics on mute, except when you're speaking, that'll just eliminate any background noise or distractions. And that mute button is depicted with the red arrow at the bottom. Chloe, next one. Uh, and steering committee members, if you could have your video cameras on today, as long as it's available to you, really helps with our engagement with each other and facilitation. Advance, please. We use the raise your hand button to indicate when we wanna speak, um, ask a question or offer a comment. And so that's, you click on that reactions button in the lower right-hand corner. Well, if you could hit again, pops up a window, you'll see the raise your hand indicator at the bottom there, you can click that. And I will call on you in the order I see your hand go up. Um, as I offer you always, please feel free to, if you can't find that and you really wanna make a comment, you can also wave your hands at me and I will keep an eye out for you. We could advance. Um, we're going to be using um, the chat function, also steering committee members. So if you want to contribute a comment or ask a question in writing rather than verbally, you can use that chat button and chat directly with me. And then finally, um, if you could click ahead, Chloe, uh, if you'd like to see each other on the screen, we do have um, me and our ASL interpreters pinned today. But if you'd like to see um, your fellow steering committee members on the screen, you can click on that speaker view uh, and change it to gallery view and everyone who has their video camera will pop up on your screen. Let's click ahead, please. All right, this is the slide for members of the public who are joining us today. And I just want to give a shout out to all of you for giving up um, time uh, to be part of this and to observe our meeting today. We really always appreciate your, your presence here. Uh, your slides a little, a lot of similarities, but a couple of differences. If you could also keep your mics on mute um, during the duration of the meeting, the exception will be at the end. If you've signed up to offer public comment, then uh, when I call your name, I'll ask you to unmute. Um, I'm gonna ask community members, please, to keep your video cameras off uh, unless you're making a public comment. At the, when I invite you to make a public comment at the very end of the meeting, you can turn your video camera on. But Again, it really does help um, with my facilitation just to be able to see the steering committee members on video. Uh, Vance, please. And again, same recommendation to you. If you'd like to see all of the steering committee members on the screen, you can click on that speaker view button, choose gallery, and you will be able to see all the steering committee members. All right, I see uh, steering committee members have arrived. So steering committee members, this is a heads up. I'm going to ask you to offer um, an, an introduction, each of you. Um, I'm gonna ask you to say your name, your pronouns, um, your agency. If you'd like to offer an acknowledgement of the land from which you are calling from, please offer that. Uh, and then I have a, a little ice melter question for you. And it's a selfish one today. I'm gonna give you a heads up now so you have a few minutes to prepare while I run through the um, agenda. I am under the weather and so is Nicola. And so I'm gonna ask you today if you could offer recommendation for a movie or TV that I should binge while I'm feeling crummy. Um, and community members and guests, uh, please, if you'd like to offer some in the chat, go ahead, send them to me, I'll read them out. Um, so steering committee members, while I go through the agenda today, if you could um, just give some thought to what your go-to is when you're feeling crummy, 
uh, Nicola and I I'm, would really appreciate it. Okay, so um, Chloe, do we have a slide for our agenda? All right, I'm just gonna walk folks through the agenda and give our steering committee members a few minutes to think of their um, answers to the prompt question today. Um, our objectives today, oh, back up one, please, Chloe. There we go. Our objectives today are uh, first session is over. Congratulations, um, Senator Dingram, Representative Orwell on a great session. Um, we're gonna review some of the key provisions of the House Bill 1134 and how they will affect the CRIS process uh, and discuss some next steps on these provisions. Uh, we're also going to hear a few other updates from our um, state agency folks. And then we're going to spend some time reflecting on recent discussions from the March, April, and May CRIS committee meetings and, and talk about how this group, the steering committee, can best lead the CRIS in continuing to have some of these difficult but really meaningful and important conversations for our work. We'll confirm action items and next steps and then hear public comment and adjourn it too. That's the slide, please, Chloe. So here's how our timing is breaking down. We're gonna go through our welcome and introductions momentarily. Uh, then we're gonna devote a little time to the key updates I mentioned, um, and then spend most of the remainder of the meeting on the discussion, how, um, how this steering committee can continue to lead the Chris in engaging in difficult but necessary conversations. We'll do action items and next steps at 145, and then we'll hold our public comment period starting at 148. Uh, I do not at this point have anyone signed up to make public comment today. So if you are a member of the community participating in this meeting today and you would like to make a public comment, please send uh, Brittany Thompson a chat and we will reserve some time at the end of the meeting. I'll call on as many of you as I can um, before our time runs out. I think that's it for slides, right, Chloe? Yeah, we can take them down. Okay, great. All right. So hopefully steering committee member, oh, and I apologize. I, um, we also have two ASL interpreters joining us today um, and you will see Paula pinned on your screen. Charlotte is also joining us and we'll be switching off with Paula. So big thank you to Paula and Charlotte for offering ASL interpretation support today. All right, uh, so hopefully our steering committee members are ready to offer a, a um, their introductions, and I'm gonna call on you in the order I see on my screen. So let's start with Senator Dingra. Good afternoon, everyone. Manka Dingra, State Senator from the 45th Legislative District. I use she, her pronouns. And, um, oh gosh, I'll say when you are sick, I think you should definitely binge watch Firefly Lane. I absolutely love that show along with the um, actors and actresses there. And that is definitely my go-to. Perfect, I appreciate that, thank you. Nicola, hopefully you're, you're taking notes yourself on what we should be watching, what we're feeling not so, not so fabulous. Betsy, how about you? Looking for the mute button. Hi everyone, Betsy Jones, Health Management Associates. I use she, her pronouns. Um, and I facilitate, um, I oversee the facilitation of this process for those of you who don't know me. Um, and Jamie and Nicola, I don't watch a lot of TV, but I loved Severance. I've heard a lot of people recommend that one. And yes, thank you for clarifying, Betsy. I should have I should have said that when I when I called on you that Betsy's not an official member of the steering committee. She is uh, the the wheels that get that get us all going here. So um, she's the wheels behind this process. So thank you, Betsy. Thanks, Jamie. <laughs> Carrie. Sorry, all I had. Zoom is difficult for me sometimes. Um, so I apologize. Uh, Carrie Waterland, uh, I am a member of the steering committee representing the healthcare authority seat. I use she, her pronouns. Um, I'm super excited to be here today because I'm going to talk about my very, very favorite show, which is Chopped. Um, if you've heard me talk about it before, I love it. And so, um, not that I ever hoped to get sick, but I was just sick last week and I completely binged on Chopped. So Jamie, it worked for me. Nicola, it worked for me. I feel better. Chopped is the way to go. 
Um, and I am, I wanted to do something really briefly just to let the steering committee know that I'm going to start to do a couple things when I am on open public meetings. And one of those is um, if given an opportunity to do a land acknowledgement, I will. And just briefly um, uh, wanted to acknowledge that I'm on the, the Puyallup tribes lands. Um, and, I, and I think I have talked about that a little bit when I did the acknowledgement, but I'm also going to start to really acknowledge and say, um, 988 is up and running, it is available. And please, please call this number if you're in crisis or if you just need somebody to talk to. So I'm uh, just throwing that out there to let folks know when we have a public forum, I'm going to use the opportunity to share 988. Um, and uh, part of that is also going to be, I'm taking a lot of time, I'm sorry, Jamie, but I hope it's useful and meaningful to folks, is to also acknowledge when I have an opportunity to do my land acknowledgement that part of what we're doing in Washington state to continue to show support um, for the work that tribes have been doing to hold um, sovereign and sacred our lands is that we are um, listening and hearing and supporting the native and strong line that they have asked for. So thank you to tribes. Um, and just wanted to put a bug into everybody's ear on how I'm kind of using um, time that I get to my full advantage to brag about some of the things that are going on. Thank you for thank you for letting me take that time, Jamie. Oh, I loved it. Thank you, Carrie. And now it's a good call to action to 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 call those things out every time. So appreciate that, and appreciate the recommendation. I do like chopped. Vipasha. That button. Um, my name is Vipasha Mukherjee. She they pronouns. Um, I would just give a land acknowledgement be to the broader um, group of people who, the Coast Salish people, I'm in Kirkland. Uh, in terms of uh, things to see, so I have three. Uh, one is Stranger Things, because it mixes sci-fi with kids and whodunit. Those are like some of my favorite mixtures. My favorite shows of all time is probably The Wired. If any, The Wire. If you haven't seen it, you must. It is a mind blowing series about the Baltimore area. And um, I just heard yesterday about this film called The Listener by Steve Buscemi. It's based on. Um, there's only one actor on stage on the in the movie, but she's a crisis line volunteer who is answering phones. So I'm very curious to see this movie. She actually works for the Warm Line. So it was an interesting discussion on KCTS on that movie. So I'm not sure which ones are good when you're sick, though. Maybe. Okay, yeah, the listener may sound maybe one where I have to be feeling well and then I can really. Stranger Things is fun, though. Yeah. yeah. I can vouch for The Wire. My husband, when he was recovering from surgery, he binged on The Wire. So that would, that's, that's clearly a good call. Michelle. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Michelle Roberts. I use she, her pronouns, and I represent um, the Washington State Department of Health on this committee. Um, honored to be here. I do also want to give a land acknowledgement, and I am coming to you from um, Tumwater today, which is the lands of um, Coast Salish people as well, including um, the Nisqually, Cowlitz. Am I frozen? Okay, no, good. <laughs> and Scots and Island Thai uh, tribes. And I just really want to um, thank them for their stewardship of these lands and waters and really acknowledge the learning that we have done from our tribal communities for our um, behavioral health and suicide prevention efforts. It's very critical um, to, to help us serve better and help us serve in partnership um, with our tribal communities. Um, and we strive to support them to the best of our ability as we recognize our role as visitors in their communities. Um, as far as TV shows, um, I will, when you said this, it's always your mind goes blank, but I thought of this funny, quirky British humor show that we've watched on Prime that maybe people should know is out there. It's called The Outlaws, and it is really entertaining if you've not watched it and you like good some good British humor. So it's about a eclectic group of people doing community service um, in England. So um, it will make you laugh. I always enjoy British humor. So thank you for that, Michelle. Amber.
Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Amber Leaders. Uh, I use she, her pronouns. I am a senior policy advisor in the governor's office to Governor Inslee. Uh, and I, let's see, in terms of what do I binge? I think it depends on if you go, you want to go dark or you want to go light. So if you want to go dark, uh, I really have been into yellow jackets lately. Uh, very good show, but be forewarned, it is dark. Um, but uh, if you want to go light, I always go to my old favorites. And one of my favorites is 30 Rock. So I always recommend binging 30 Rock. That's 30 Rock. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and Yellow Jackets, I've never heard of. So I'll have to look into that. Thank you, Amber. Dr. Snowden. Thank you and good afternoon. I'm Mark Snowden. I use he, him pronouns. Uh, I'm the chief of psychiatry at Harborview Medical Center and the vice chair for clinical services in the Department of Psychiatry at the School of Medicine. And I'm on the steering committee as the representative from the Harborview Behavioral Health Institute. And uh, my binge recommendation initially was going to be science fiction, but since Bukasha took that one, I will go to my second favorite, which is probably more the truth anyway, and that's sports documentaries. And the one that I'm into the most, that I can't even count how many times I've seen it, is the 10 or 11 part series on Michael Jordan and the Chicago Bulls called The Last Dance. And so if you've not seen it and you have any interest in basketball, I highly recommend it. I just, we just watched over the weekend, we watched that that movie Air about um, the Air Jordans, which I know sounds like a really boring, boring topic, but actually was a really fun movie. Um, so maybe maybe now I'll dive into that, that documentary. Um, I don't see Representative Orwell on. Uh, she's another member of our steering committee. And then Megan, I saw you jump in. Do you want to introduce yourself, Megan Celedonia? Hi there. Oops, let me see. I'm struggling with my video here. It's not turning on. Okay. Hi there. My name is Megan Celedonia. I work in the governor's office as the 988 coordinator. It's nice to be here today. Um, I use she, her pronouns. And in terms of a binge worthy show, especially if I'm feeling sick, I always look for like light and easy to watch and happy. So I really liked the Bridgerton um, shows on Netflix. I've seen, I think there's three seasons now. So very fun. All right, I feel like, um, and I think this cold is on the tail end, so I probably won't get through all of the recommendations you offered to me today, but it's really good to have a lineup because my my younger daughter, who's a theater kid, seems to always be bringing home some kind of virus. So I'm sure there'll be other ones ahead this year. Thank you everyone for that. And um, I did get another recommendation in the chat, um, an echo for severance and also, of course, Ted Lasso, so. Um, all right, let's keep going here. We're going to dive now into some key updates. So I'm going to prompt this. A um, few things we're going to go through. Um, Megan or Amber from the governor's office is going to share an update on um, compensation for people with lived experience. And then we're going to dive into House Bill 1134 and its implications for the CRIS work. So Betsy's going to talk about the extended committee time frame. I think we have a slide accompanying that. And then Megan's going to um, share some updates regarding process. Um, and I think uh, also Carrie and Michelle might be jumping in there too. So Megan, I'll kind of lean on you to, to prompt them if there's pieces that, that they should cover. So why don't we start with um, Megan or Amber to update us on um, conversation for people with lived experience. Yeah, um, I'm going to get us started, but I'd ask Megan to sort of chime in if I forget or miss anything um, on this conversation. So we have been talking a lot, and I think we've talked with um, a number of you sort of independently about how to address the need to provide compensation for people with lived experience on both the CRIS as well as our subcommittees. Um, so we have for a little bit of context, uh, there was a bill passed and uh, uh, some of our legislators can probably speak to this better than I can, but there was a bill passed, I think, two legislative sessions ago that create an opportunity for uh, people with lived experience who serve on a variety of boards, commissions, work groups, task forces to be eligible for compensation for um, 
providing that service to the state. It is a service to the state and having individuals with lived experience participate and be able to participate is really critical to the way that we are um, we do government and the way that we're putting policy and recommendations together. So I think, so we've talked about, and then what that does is it creates an opportunity for agencies to be reimbursed from the Office of Financial Management out of a pool of dollars um, <clears throat> based on uh, lived experience members who are serving on various groups uh, as participants. So we um, are continuing to look into how to best do that. There's some logistics pieces that we're working out with the Office of Financial Management. But under the bill, uh, it's fairly clear that our members who are identified and appointed on the CRIS as those with lived experience would be eligible for this compensation, as well as those members with lived experience on our identified um, and appointed subgroup committees. Um, we do not, Unfortunately, we don't think the lived experience subcommittee group right now is currently eligible under what we've created because it's not an appointment process. It's been more of an invitation process. However, I think we've been discussing about whether or not going forward, we should establish something similar to what the Children and Youth Behavioral Health Work Group has done, which is a dedicated pool for members who participate as part of that work group. And I think that's something that um, probably the steering committee should talk about and should be on our agenda as we're thinking about, you know, the governor's budget and the next legislative session about um, how do we handle that so that we can address for that part of the group as well. Because I think it, to be fair, it makes sense for all of our members with lived experience who are participating, um, but we are sort of somewhat constrained in terms of what the, the current requirements and the criteria are. So that's the update. Megan, did I miss anything that we wanted to cover in terms of it? I'm happy to answer questions from anyone on the steering committee if you have any. I don't have anything to add. Thank you, Amber. Thank you, Amber. And just a quick clarification, um, Betsy's going to do an overview of the timeline on House Bill 1134, and then I think uh, Carrie and Michelle will kick off to talk a little bit about process, and, and Megan will add some notes after that. So um, yep. that's that's a little uh, amendment to what I said earlier. Vipasha. I just wanted to say um, I, I had three things to bring up today, and Amber and Megan, you all brought up one of those things, which was compensation for lived experience. I really appreciate it. We've been having a lot of conversation about that. And uh, yes, our lived experience subcommittee is a more open you know, group. People come, but there are some core people who do a lot of background work. So, um, and I, I will just repeat what I've already told BHI and HMA is that from what I understand, based on the rules, it's the attendance of the meetings, but uh, for the future, since there are legislators here, to think about the prep that goes into coming into those meetings and compensate, uh, you know, framework of how to compensate for that, um, for all people with lived experience. But thank you so much for bringing this up. This is very meaningful to the lived experience uh, group. Thank you. Thank you, Vipasha and Amber as well. I think we we will make a note in terms of action items and next steps to follow up on more of that detail and framework for how we do that. So thanks for raising that. All right, let's turn it over to Betsy first. And Betsy, I think you have a slide to accompany um, the update on committee process. Is that right? I do. I have one slide. Okay. We can go to that slide. Thank you. And then I have just a couple of comments related to the slide. So um, we're grateful for um, the extension of our work with 1134. Um, we were scheduled to end with a final report in January of 24. Um, but what what the extension has afforded us, which is a, the extension is, is a year, um, we'll have an, a third progress report um, in January. Uh, which will summarize the activities as it always does um, that we will it, we will have engaged in this year, um, it, and it will include recommendations related to our designated 988 contact hubs, and then the final report with recommendations um, addressing system elements outlined by the legislation um, will be delivered in January of um, 2025, um, and. Um, what I wanted to share is that the, the extension really allows us time to focus on areas of discussion that are needed 
um, rather than having to really do everything fast in this last year. So um, the extension has allowed us to focus more on our crisis response services continuum and the resources needed to expand this year. Um, we've done a lot of work there um, during our Chris committee meetings this year. And this summer, we're going to move into um, focusing on um, synthesizing the discussions and the recommendations that have come out of the CRIS and our work groups um, this year. This will um, help to establish the foundation of recommendations for the steering committee to consider um, for the January 2024 progress report. And it also reflects um, the time that we've been given to deliberate more and, and excuse me, develop those recommendations. And then in 2024, we're gonna turn our attention to two rema remaining focus areas. Um, the first being system goals, metrics, and oversight, and the second being system infrastructure, including technology workforce, um, cross-system coordination, um, and other um, important conversations. So these are all um, elements that are called for um, by House Bill 1477. That's my update, Jamie. Great, thank you. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Michelle Roberts and Carrie Waterlin. I'm not sure which of you would like to go first, but um, I believe you're gonna be speaking a little bit on the um, agency work to implement some of the changes coming out of House Bill 1134. So specifically around um, endorsement of community-based crisis teams and mobile rapid response teams, training collaboratives, um, anything else here to cover? Is that time? Yeah. yeah, I think Megan was actually maybe going to start. She had a couple oh, of updates. Sorry, I, I I just clarified that that I was going to ask you two to kick it off and then oh, okay. and do a follow up. Perfect. But um, Chloe, can you take down the slide and then we can? Oh, great, thank you. Thanks. I can, Michelle. I can go first if you want. I don't have too too much um, because as as timing works, um, our team is actually ironically getting together tomorrow to discuss how to operationalize a lot of these things. So um, what I can tell you though is, that doesn't mean they haven't been working, right? Many of you may have heard and remember us talking about that um, best practice toolkit for 1477 that was adapted and adopted, right? To start standardizing the crisis system and really start to talk about how would we collaborate with our partners? So that little bad boy is gonna make some more appearances because components of that guide include mobile crisis outreach program guides and things like that that are gonna be used for the foundation of the endorsement process. So they're already starting a lot of this pre-work and what it's gonna do is really give the team time to um, digest a lot of what they heard through the development process um, of the best practice guide around kind of training and what would be needed and how we can make partnerships with local leaders to really, really build upon regional collaborations. So a lot of the things that they've been working on, they really are anticipating using those tomorrow as a jumping off point for discussions for how we are going to get this endorsement of the community-based crisis teams and the mobile rapid response teams up and running, as well as all of those training collaboratives. We're also gonna be pulling together a meeting um, relatively soon. I don't know exactly when, and truth be told, it may have already been scheduled and I'm just not in the loop, um, to meet with University of Washington and BHI who do have some, some portions of the training collaborative pieces and some um, just some partnership opportunities for us in the new piece of legislation as well. So be looking, I think, for a little bit more concrete information about the training collaboratives about our work with UW BHI and about the endorsement process um, in the next few weeks and know that all of that stuff that's been shared up to this point um, has been all for something. It's gonna be used as building blocks and getting us started in a really good way. So um, I, for one, I'm looking forward to kind of, I think seeing what the team and everybody else develops on this, but that right now is what I've got for everybody today, Jamie. Carrie, Michelle, you have anything to add to that from DOH perspective? Yeah, I can say um, 
House Bill 1134 um, did a few smaller things, not as big as the endorsement piece, but for Department of Health, one of the pieces um, is continued work around um, social media and promotion of the 988 call line. So um, plans had been in place for that, and there'll be continued planning um, as a joint venture with a lot of different partners, including Healthcare Authority. Um, and um, continuing input from many groups, including um, Chris subcommittees as we work on um, more promotion. And for everybody here, I think, at least I think the steering committee is on the same page. We wanted everybody to feel mm -hmm. like the call lines had a lot of time to settle, had some time to settle in um, as they were staffing up. And now is definitely the time for broader promotion. So excited that um, that was even outlined further. Um, in House Bill 1134. So that's kind of one um, one to come. So we'll keep everybody updated as we work through that. Um, there was also um, in 1134 reference to some co-location work. Um, so that's between 988 call centers and 911 call centers to help support um, ongoing collaboration, trust building, um, clarity and roles and responsibilities um, between those groups just to make sure on the ground things are moving as smoothly as they can as um, services and supports are kind of handed back and forth between those two groups. So um, that ties into Carrie's work about um, some of the um, work they're doing with guidance documents, but also provides, um, we got some funding to help support the three call centers with each having a co-location, um, which we're starting off as a pilot and figuring out we'll work with our call centers together and our 911 partners and others to figure out what would that look like long-term if we need to develop some criteria around what co-location would look like and some processes. But all three call centers have some plans that um, we'll be able to get funding to support some initial work with co-location. Um, so excited to see that start. And then um, the bill also did include an extension of some of the timelines around um, our designation of crisis center hubs. So um, gives us gives us another year to get that work done. And we're in a rulemaking, early stages of a rulemaking process, still working on our tribal consultation and our community engagement around that rulemaking. So much more to come on those pieces. And there was one final piece. Oh, I just, my final piece is around some of our work with the agricultural community. The bill did continue to highlight how important it is to make sure we're providing um, appropriate services and thinking about training and supports for um, call center staff um, to best serve that community who we know is at high risk of death by suicide. So we've got um, some language in there to help us continue um, to look at um, how, how that work is happening, how we're providing supports and what are opportunities for enhanced support for that community. I think those are the pieces for DOH um, coming out of the bill. Excellent. I'll hand it probably over to Megan now. Back to Megan then. Yeah, thank you, Carrie and Michelle. That was really helpful. Megan. Yeah, thanks. So I just wanted to take a couple minutes and speak a little bit uh, to my role in terms of some reminders. So as we think about rolling out work with 1134, we can understand as a group how that's happening as well. And so as 988 coordinator, one of the key things that I do is work really closely with healthcare authority and Department of Health staff on implementing the work of 988 broadly, but then especially when we have new changes, trying to think about how we incorporate in, that into the scope of our already going on work. And so we're managing this as a large cross-agency project. And so what that means is that we have a project structure. We have our executive sponsors with Michelle and Carrie at the helm there. We have uh, project managers at each, at each agency, both in the services side of the work and the IT tech side of the work. We have several subject matter experts. We work with a lot of stakeholder groups. Um, and our goal is to really identify our shared work cross agency and understand the leadership and ownership of work at individual agencies. So we make sure we're supporting with collaboration and wraparound support overall. And we work to develop scope. What is our job in this work and what does done look like and when are we getting it done? And so that's what it really means from the large project management view um, across the agencies. And so I, um, I, I don't know if I can share my screen, Jamie, I just have two slides and this will just kind of uh, show at a high level what um, Carrie and Michelle were alluding to in terms of new work. 
but I don't have to if I can't share. I don't. I, don't uh, I think um, Brittany or Chloe can probably help make that happen. Megan, I made you co-host, so you should have sharing capabilities. Oh, okay. So let's see if I can get this up here. So one of the things I think Carrie mentioned it. Um, are you seeing my screen yet, Jamie? Okay. So one of the things that Carrie mentioned is, uh, you know, we obviously had legislative session, we passed new bills, and um, we have new funding across agency to do the work. And so individual agencies are at this point where they're assimilating new work, new changes, new funds into what their overall programmatic support looks like. Um, and then what we're doing from a work standpoint is kind of breaking out the new work of 1134. And so I'm not going to go through everything on this wheel, and I know it's not a super pretty slide, but we have a lot of new work for Department of Health that builds on work that's already in 1477 that we're looking at. And um, going back to what I said about what Carrie mentioned earlier is that we have a two-day in-person meeting this week with the leads, project managers, and subject matter experts at Department of Health and Healthcare Authority to do a deeper dive into scope adjustments for the project based on new legislation. And so um, this is just high level, broad brush at a glance, what new work does Department of Health have? And so as we're brainstorming as a group and we're talking about how are we gonna move from where we are today to where we wanna go, we can have those at a glance reminders of what we're doing. So um, new requirements for uh, training, co-location, data sharing agreements, call center platform work um, related to the IT tech pieces, all of that that Michelle already alluded to, we're gonna be considering. And then healthcare authority, same thing. They have a lot of new work in 1134, um, including new mobile crisis response teams, um, expanding that work and what that would will do in terms of serving our communities and how we work with first responders as well. Lots of new grant work, how we're funding um, the work, how we're gonna pay for the work, how do we continue to maximize our Medicaid match? Um, just a lot of things. So I just wanted to update the group that we do have a pretty solid infrastructure in place from a project perspective to support our agencies moving forward in their requirements while we also are tracking what our other agencies and partners are doing as well. So I hope that um, this was a useful update in allowing you to have an opportunity to see what we're doing a little bit behind the scenes to um, consider new work with legislative session as we move forward. That was great, Megan, thank you so much. And if you wouldn't mind um, sending those slides to HMA, they'll add them to the deck that gets posted on the website so folks can review that again if they wanna remind themselves what you shared today. We'd appreciate that. Um, I, I'm i gonna ask Senator Dingra to just speak a few minutes about some of the um, background on how, how 1134 came to be, in particular focusing on some of the questions that have been raised about um, 911 tech interoperability and also um, this was mentioned but by Michelle, but maybe a little more about um, the resources or provisions supporting access for rural and agricultural populations. So Senator Dingra. Thank you um, so much for that, Jamie. I think what Megan forgot to mention is that her own position was extended um, because we want her to continue doing this work till 2028. So we made sure that we're not losing her anytime soon. So that, in my opinion, was a critical component of um, this bill, along with everything else. Um, and then a few other things we're all going to have to get used to. We've been calling them call centers and call center hubs. We actually renamed them as a designated 988 contact hubs. And this was really about taking a look at how in the future, uh, where the call centers might be or how they're being utilized. And so just calling them the designated 988 contact hubs. Um, so we did make changes to the, um, the technology components. We do know that we're gonna need two platforms. And um, in our first bill, um, I think we were very um, prescriptive on what all we wanted in these technology platforms. I think there's been so much work being done with the subcommittee um, on that. And so we provided a little bit more flexibility um, 
on what could be in the technology platform. We really do need our federal partners to help out with um, potential geolocation or other kind of um, services. And so instead of you know really mandating the the operability between 911 and 988, we've created that flexibility to say that we have to make sure we are doing a lot of work in terms of building uh, protocols that um, the, the hubs have that HCA will approve and really making sure that we have that connection. We have the co-location that uh, was already mentioned before, but really making sure that um, we're not restricting ourselves on the technology component. We did extend the deadline by when we have to adopt these platforms. And um, so I think we're just going to see what that looks like. But I think everyone's been very clear on the fact that they want very smooth transitions between 911 and 988 and very clear protocols and what that looks like and data tracking and on uh, responses and where we're showing up on that. Um, and we mentioned about the agricultural component. Uh, I think given the high rates of suicide amongst our farmers, it was important for our rural communities and for all of us that we also do very specific training around that. And, you know, it's great for us to be doing all this work, but we also have to make sure that we are doing a lot of outreach and communication about it. All last year, I think we were kind of cautious in how we were unveiling 988 because we didn't want to overpromise. We really wanted to make sure we had that infrastructure and the uh, call centers ready to take on this work. So this year, the focus really um, is on outreach. And so the bill did require that 98 hubs must be must display the 98 crisis hotline information on their website, their social media including descriptions on uh, specialized lines, like we talked about the, um, the line for our Native Americans, um, but also including the specialized line for vets, for Spanish speakers, for the LGBTQ plus population, and really talking about resources uh, for programs and services related to suicide prevention for the agricultural community. So, um, you know, this is a lot of these recommendations and ideas in this bill came from our uh, meetings we've had for the last year and a half and really making sure that we are taking this work to the next level and ensuring that the bill is modified in order to reflect the conversations and the learning that has happened in the last year and a half. And I think that was um, all and I'm happy to answer any questions. I appreciate that. Um, I am going to, before we move on, I just want to pause and see if any steering committee members have any questions for any of the other steering committee members who shared updates today. Any clarifications or follow up? You know, I'll just add that we did talk briefly about. Um, the protocols between 911, 98, and data collection. And um, I think we did mention the enhanced um, teams. And I do want to make sure that um, when we respond to 988, every jurisdiction is going to uh, come up with a way in which they are doing this work. And so I know there's a question about um, MHPs co respond with law enforcement for the enhanced. Um, rate, it is going to be mental health professional teams only, but other than the enhanced rate, I think there's a lot of flexibility and what that initial response looks like given um, the geographic areas that we all come from. Thank you for jumping on that question too, Senator Dinkra. And I, I appreciate you you jumping in with uh, this these uh, reflections on the legislative session today. Uh, all right, any other questions or comments from the steering committee before we move on to our discussion? All right, I'm just gonna check and make sure we covered everything. Looks like we did. Oh, Bipasha. 
I have to, for the record, say whatever materials you'll generate for educating the community uh, to please make it cross-cultural and available in multiple languages. And please, at every stage, loop in people with lived experience to inform uh, from different communities to inform those materials. I'm stating the obvious. I know everyone here believes in that, but I just, as a lived experience person, want to say that for the record. Thank you. And, and I'll just say, Bipasha, it's important to state that because we haven't reached the time in our culture where these things come automatically. This is still something we're incorporating in our policies and procedures. So I really do appreciate you specifically stating that out. I think it is important until and unless this becomes the default for everyone. I, I was just thinking in the same way that Carrie was saying, she's going to mention the 988 line now at, at every opportunity that she has to speak in a public meeting. It feels like this is a good thing to reiterate. It can't, it, it, it bears repeating over and over again. So I appreciate you raising that, Vipasha. All right, um, let's Mimi. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt. Um, we had a couple of announcements about um, Bipasha's seat, as well as um, speaking to um, the geolocation subcommittee. So, um, oh, thank you for catching those. If I we could kick it back to Megan and or Amber. Yes, thanks for catching those, Megan and or Amber. Do you have uh, you want to share a couple updates there too? Uh, I will go ahead. So, welcome, Bipasha, to the steering committee. Yay! So no one's a stranger to be Pasha. She has done a great job being an inclusive leader for us in the Chris and does a lot of work with our lived experience uh, committee members. And she will join us as a voting member in August. So thank you, B. Pasha, for your leadership. And I'll just jump in with a quick clarification. Um, it is the lived experience seat on the steering committee, correct, Megan? Yes. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Did I say the wrong thing? No, 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 no. No, you said okay. everything right. I just wanted to <laughs> I just wanted to make sure that was clear to everyone. I mean, Pasha is wonderful and and um, but it it, it is uh, she's the person occupying the seat. So <laughs> yes, no, thank you. That's an important clarification. Yeah. So, okay, uh, the only other update I had today was to talk a little bit more about next steps with our geo geolocation subcommittee. So one of the things that 1134 asks the Chris to do is to examine privacy issues related to the federal planning effort to route calls by location versus area code while still maintaining confidence in the 988 line. And so uh, we've convened DOH, Healthcare Authority, um, and myself to begin talking about this subcommittee and thoughts that we would have in terms of recommendations to the CRIS and our facilitators on how we might kick this off. So we do have a, uh, a meeting scheduled on June 21st. So I think that's, um, I don't know, a week and a half, two weeks from now uh, to really solidify what we're thinking that would be good next steps for this committee. Uh, things that we've flagged that will, of course, be worth considering are, you know, making sure we're clear on the role of a subcommittee and developing a draft charter for the subcommittee, just to be clear on what we're doing and how we do our work. Um, Geofencing, uh, in addition to geolocation, is an important topic right now, which identifies a location within a certain area of someone's location at a certain time. Um, versus the exact location where someone is. So that is definitely a national topic right now, one that's being considered um, uh, at the vibrant level as well in terms of their platform. So we definitely wanna dig into that a little bit. Um, privacy issues, data sharing, and when, ex when exceptions to those things come into play when a crisis may occur, um, anonymity in general, and ongoing partnership with 911. Uh, these are some issues that have risen to the top of some initial conversations that we've had. Um, so the idea is to um, solidify some of our impressions on June 21st and be able to provide some recommendations in moving forward that committee and, and gaining some input on that. Megan, thanks for sharing those updates. Just a quick comment here from Bipasha or a request to definitely have people with lived experience, especially from marginalized communities and different experiences on the subcommittee, please. So thanks for putting that in the chat, Pasha. Steering committee members, any other questions or feedback for Megan on those last two updates or any of the updates we just talked about? 
Okay. We are exactly on our agenda time, which I can say is rare to be right on the, on the number there. Um, so we're gonna move into our discussion. I'm gonna ask Dr. Snowden to kick us off to set the context. But before I do that, I just wanna remind, we sent out some prompt questions to our steering committee members to just help you start thinking about, um, because we're asking for some specifics here, how to approach this conversation. So I'm gonna put those in the chat just as a reminder for um, our steering committee members and also for our, our community members to know where we're going here. So that's going in the chat right now. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Snowden, who's gonna set some context for our discussion on leading uh, the Chris in, in having difficult but necessary conversations. So Dr. Snowden. Thanks, Jamie. Uh, and it's a pleasure to do this. Uh, I have a visual aid that I'll explain in a minute, but I'm gonna scoot off screen just momentarily. <laughs> And this is the visual aid. I'll get a little bit farther back so you can see it. But for folks who don't know what this is, this is a bonsai tree. And about 15 years ago, I got into the art of bonsai. Uh, and it's a very uh, meditative uh, process. And um, in doing it, uh, particularly in the spring when there's some routine things that have to be done, uh, it dawned on me that there's some similarities to being a bonsai gardener and this process. And if you just bear with me a minute, I'm going to try to bring this all together. But I like the, the use of the metaphor because I think it can help explain things better than just my words alone might do. Uh, if you go down to the bonsai museum, uh, on the Burlington grounds, there's a sign that says, leave space for the birds. And what that means is that uh, in the development of a tree, there's lots of things that you have to do. And the most common activity that's identified with bonsai is the use of wire to wrap around trunks and branches to then bend those into the shape that you would like the tree to be but that it does not naturally grow in. Um, there's an obvious problem with that because if you bend it too far, you will break the branch and all hope will be lost. Uh, the more subtle problem that develops that you only learn, and I've only learned after a few years of doing this, is that if you leave the wires on too short a time, it doesn't do the job. But if you leave them on too long, the wires actually start to bite into the tree and the trunk. And when you go to remove them, it leaves very ugly scars. And the analogy to our work is that uh, despite our best intentions, I think we have to acknowledge that our system hurts people. Uh, we, we scar people sometimes emotionally for years. As I have come to try to understand some of the complexity of our workplace and workforce challenges, it's also clear to me that through, again, only good intentions, we sometimes scar the people who actually do the work because of the conditions that we have them work in or the way we actually treat each other. And so this notion of how do we in this committee sort of translate some of these skills, uh, I think the same applies. We have to be willing to bend and to redirect growth to have it be a new vision. But we have to do that with care so that we don't break and scar people. The other thing that's relevant to bonsai is that the most common mistake that beginners like me made well, five years or so ago, is you buy a tree and you like it and you prune all the branches and you try to make it look like a bonsai right away. And no tree is ready for that when you first buy it. The best thing you can do is to actually take the tree and put it into a big pot and let it grow for two or three years with very little touching of it. Uh, and so a lot of the time you are simply sitting and waiting and learning from what the tree is trying to tell you. And after you do that, what you see is that the tree develops lots and lots of branches. And from that, you now have lots of choices that you can make about the ultimate design. 
what does that have to do with this process that we're in? I think the relevance is that for as much as we would like this process to be one where we are making final decisions and changing the system, that is actually not our role. Our role is to create a process where we create as many branches, as many people that give us voices, and those voices lead to more branches that I will call ideas. And from those ideas, we will be able to then make recommendations to the people whose job it will ultimately be to implement those recommendations and to change the system. But if we try to do that prematurely, it's like taking a tree that's really not developed and forcing an idea on it that it is really not ready to do. And so it requires patience to have this process play out. The way I envision my role on the steering committee is not to be talking all the time, but to really to work behind the scenes with HMA and other steering committee members to create a process that allows us to get as many people and their voices and their ideas on the table as we can, especially people who are normally excluded or marginalized from these processes. As the chief of psychiatry and the vice chair, I have lots of opportunities to talk to people and to have my ideas out there. But there are many people, particularly people with lived experience who don't have the opportunity to do that. And so I think it's really important that we have created a process that prioritizes getting those voices onto the table and being heard. So that at the end of the day, we will have many more ideas that we can choose from. Much like in bonsai work, at the end of the day, we won't be able to keep all the branches. Not every idea that gets thrown out will be able to go and be implemented. But we will have a much better product at the end of the day if we can be patient and prioritizing getting as many of those ideas out there as we can, even when it is difficult to hear sometimes. From my own personal experience, uh, I'm very proud of the emergency room work and the inpatient psychiatry work we do at Harborview. But it's very clear that part of our goal in creating a better crisis system is to have fewer people have to use the emergency room and have fewer people have to use the inpatient units. But it doesn't mean that what we do here at Harborview isn't value. And so I have to remember that in this process is not specifically critiquing me or our services at Harborview, but it's trying to get more voices on the table so we come up with the ideas that we need to truly improve the system. With that, I will stop. Oh, Dr. Snow, I really appreciated your words so much there. Thank you. And I feel like I, I would like to re review this recording a few times because I don't think I could ever do that the justice there. Um, that's a really good setup for our conversation. Um, I heard a lot of pieces there about um, the importance of giving voice to a, a lot of different perspectives, you know, and emphasizing people with lived experience to, you know, recognize that there's urgency, but also that that growing this bonsai takes time and listening to those voices and getting all those ideas out. And I also heard you, and please correct me if I have this wrong, talking about how um, when the, we're hearing things from people with lived experience or others that critique the system, it is not personal to us. Um, it's, it's an opportunity for us to listen and, um, and work together to improve. Um, so I appreciate you setting that all up. And I would like to turn it back to the steering committee now. We, we've had, uh, we've, I think we've finally at long last gotten to a place where we could really start to wrestle with um, some of the some of the challenging topics like we did in, at the um, March, April, and May meetings. And um, I think it's a good opportunity for us to reflect on where we are and how we can how we can improve, how we can support and lead the steering committee in continuing to do this wrestling. And so I put the prompt questions in the chat. Um, I'm going to ask steering committee members to start diving into those. And it looks like Senator Dinkra is going to get us started. I, I just wanted to make sure I thanked uh, Dr. Snowden for his words. Um, I 
I really think your analogy was so accurate. And um, I'll just add that, you know, when I used to run the therapeutic alternative unit and the mental health court, um, I was not a legislator at that time. And I would often say I challenged the legislature to make my job um, irrelevant. And it's not because I thought I wasn't doing a great job, but it's because we don't really need to have people with serious mental illness in a criminal justice system. And so when you said that about the emergency rooms, that's really where my mind went. And I think that is really at the end of the day, what we're talking about. And this is something I mentioned at the last Chris meeting was, you know, we're talking about a emergency response system and a crisis system, but the hope really is that we build a system where people can get treatment when they need it and an early intervention system. So really we are utilizing a crisis system less and less because people are getting the help they need when they need it. And um, this is really, really, really hard work. And I'll take this moment again to thank everyone who continues to show up and do this work and have these really, really hard conversations. Thank you, Senator Dingra. I'm just gonna repeat the, the prompt questions that we sent out um, for our steering committee members and that I put in the chat. Um, how can the steering committee support the CRIS in engaging in difficult but meaningful conversations? And what are some specific ways we can set the table for CRIS members to offer their perspectives and listen to and consider the voices of CRIS colleagues who may have different perspectives? So I am going to uh, call on Vipasha now. Vipasha. Oh, okay. Am I, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. All right. Loud and clear. Yeah. Zoom did something. I don't know what. So um, an important, but, um, and I know this stuff is being discussed because I Betsy has already said it is. One is if, again, officially saying on record, if we could please make our meetings in person, not all of them, but have at least one. It's been 18 months of doing this. And I can tell you that those of us in the lived experience are like, we'll get into a car and carpool and go to Eastern Washington because it's important that we have meetings accessible to everybody. So I just wanted to say that. I know that y'all are working on it, Betsy and team, but I just want to emphasize that. Um, one thing I will say is I have been a little concerned about certain voices being lived experience and trying to represent the voices of people who are marginalized. Um, I feel that there are, I don't see certain voices coming up. One specifically I'll bring to the table is the voices of LGBTQI people. I think since SCS left, I've been a little concerned that that voice is not being shown up very strongly. Um, I know that everybody can attend all the meetings. So I don't care if someone's not attending the meetings in real time, as long as they are participating either through the steering or directly with HMA about content. Um, I'm not tracking who's attending what meetings, but just in the content, I'm not hearing like I was before, especially this one group of LGBTQI people. So I'm concerned and I don't know what other people have, if anyone has to say anything about that. I'll, I have one more point to make, but I'll just be quiet for now. Okay, and I'm just going to clarify for our members or our guests rather that SES was Seattle Counseling Service and they had a representative sitting on the Chris committee, but that person stepped down a while back. And so that seat has been has been vacant for a few months, maybe. Carrie, do you remember how long ago that was? I don't remember. I apologize. No, Seattle Counseling Service is closed. So uh Yeah, right. sorry, thank you for that clarification. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So I, yeah, I just wanted to honor that person and, and say that they, that this, this, the entity went away. Yeah. Um, I will have to, to, in all honesty, I, I will have to look at HMH. I thought that we had filled the, the vacant positions. And so, sorry. I think, I'm gonna I think we had, and then that person hasn't been there. So Betsy. Well, I'm going to kick it over to Nicola to tell okay. us what the status is of that seat. If we filled it. I, I think we have, um, we definitely have sometimes members who don't come to meetings and that's um, something perhaps for the steering committee to grapple with. <clears throat> There's a, if you all would like to recommend 
um, that if after a certain point in time, I don't know that our bylaws or, you know, the charter speaks to that, Jamie, I think it does. The it does. We currently, about we currently intend for follow-up, um, but it, it, I think this is probably worth a deeper conversation about the specifics because, um, you know, I've heard from Vipasha and others that, that certain certainly people with lived experience can also have other, everyone, but in, in particular people with lived experience can have other um, complications or challenges or complexities that, that may, may make it difficult for them to participate regularly. So. so let's just, in terms of closing the loop on this one, Nicola, has that seat been appointed? And then we can we can drill into it further. No, that seat continues to be vacant. So we had another person sitting in that seat, Ellen Carruth, and, she, and Ellen had resigned. Um, so we're in the process. I believe HCA was in the process of identifying that new seat. Okay. And that was a recent resignation, right, Nicola? Fairly recent. Yeah. Um, this year. Yeah. Yeah. So Carrie, I think probably you all, you all appointed it and then we had another resignation. So we're back to getting an appointment. Yeah, and I'm hearing from the the team. Um, folks are chatting me behind the scenes um, that traditionally, and this might be just something for folks on on the Chris steering committee that maybe we can wrestle with. Is this has been a difficult seat to fill? I think we we appointed and then SCS um, closed, and that person was actually very excited and came to all of the meetings. We did a reappointment. Um, and it's my understanding that yes, that person resigned, um, and we're right in the middle right now of still trying to fix to to fix to fill that seat. Um, and and the feedback is I'm getting it's a difficult seat to fill. So maybe team I could get from our team some of what those barriers are that we might be seeing, and I can bring that back for for us to talk about, or we can just have some ideas. But I just wanted to float out there. It, it's been difficult, and I guess we are still trying to fill it. That's great, Carrie. And actually, you know, this might be an opportunity to to um, uh, on the side if your if your team is doing a little bit of that investigation is going to send you out chats. Maybe just a brief reminder of what that process is for identifying and selecting folks, because we have a lot of community members who are participating today. And if they have a reminder of that process, they might um, also have some ideas. So thank you for um, thank you for jumping in so quickly with your team. Thank you. uh, I see Bipasha and then Dr. Snowden. Bipasha? I just want to clarify my intention for bringing this up was not to shame anybody. It was to go back to um, Dr. Snowden, who who knows, I adore him. Sorry, I know these are official meetings, but I this is how I speak. But um, that bonsai, you know, the branches that inform the system, if we don't have those substantial branching of the tree and those voices, then the system, as you said, Dr. Snowden doesn't get fully informed. So that is, I don't know who else is not, and I don't care if people come to the meetings, I totally understand. But if you're listening to it later and actively giving feedback, even behind the scenes, that's fine. I just want to know that those voices, those branches are being nurtured and are flowering. That's basically what I want to say. Thank you. And I, I want to acknowledge, Bipasha, that um, we're holding space here for all of us to provide really honest and candid and thoughtful feedback. So do not apologize. I, I don't think anyone saw that as an intent to shame anyone, but rather to remind us that this is a voice that we need to hear from and that we may not be hearing it right now. So thank you for that. Dr. Snowden and then Michelle. Thanks. Um, I actually think we're doing a very good job. I, a lot of time goes on behind the scenes in planning our meetings. I, I meet weekly with the HMA team and others. And I know they meet regularly with other folks to plan. And I think overall, we do a very good job of consciously setting the agenda for the Chris meetings to call on people to speak that we really think uh, we need to hear from. Um, if there is a concern I actually have, it's with the impact of some of those voices on other Chris members. I mean, to be clear, we, we've lost some Chris members and uh, I, I, as a steering committee member, have to think about what are we doing or not doing that contributes in any way to that. And 
in one of our planning meetings that the notion of the strategy that was suggested is again to be mindful of stating about the process i think for those of us who are in it it's second nature and so we know how this works but if you're a chris member who only comes to a meeting once a month for three hours you may forget what the real process is and how this works and i think we may need to be more mindful about restating and re-educating people about what this process is and how in many ways we are generating ideas, not selecting ideas right now. The time for selecting will come, uh, but we're generating ideas. Uh, the other thing from a process standpoint that we do in a lot of the group work that I've done professionally as a psychiatrist is we sometimes have to leave time at the end of the group we're processing how that group went. And what it does is it allows anybody who had something happen in the group that is really troubling them in whatever way to be able to speak to that and to get it sort of voiced and out on the table as opposed to the meeting ending and them having these feelings that they're then having to deal with outside of the process. And so maybe at some point as we continue to engage in difficult conversations, we will have to build in some time in the agenda for reflecting on what happened today and how did it impact people so that we can get that out front uh, rather than having to be reactive to it after the fact. I really, really like that suggestion. So holding space for people to reflect on the actual discussion and the process and how that meeting went and, and how it affected them so that if there's things we can do better next time, we can, we, we know about it before it, it, it becomes too late for someone. Um, I also appreciate what you said, Dr. Snowden, about kind of, we do have a grounding at the beginning of HR Chris meetings, and it sounds like uh, we can be more specific and clear about the process and what what the Chris's role is and what, what our job is today. And also kind of remind folks of that as we go along, because for us, it's it's maybe second nature, but not necessarily for people who are coming to a meeting every month. So, so thank you for raising that. Michelle. Um, I'm gonna maybe have slightly different opinions. I mean, I do think we do a great job of being intentional in how we're setting the agendas and setting the stage and doing it. I do feel like we're not hearing from all the Chris members. And I do think ideally we should hear from them in the meetings. And how do we get to a place where that's comfortable? I mean, I welcome, I don't disagree with Vipasha, like, are they watching? Are they contributing in other ways? But I think we can't underestimate the challenge and how hard it is, um, and I think we all understand this, to have what is there, 35 or 40 seats on the Chris of people who are all involved in the system somehow, to we're working to try to create some understanding and alignment um, towards the recommendations. I agree with Mark there that it's too early for any for anywhere in our final decisions, but I think we should keep working to foster, to hear from all voices, um, all the members at that table. I see um, I, I think there's there's a portion who we're hearing from, but I think there's a portion who we who we don't hear from in that setting. And what else could we do to continue um, to make sure they feel trusted and safe in speaking up? And um, it may take some time, but um, it does feel like um, there's some more to do um, there in my mind. Um, so I just wanted to add that um, add that uh, as my perspective. Michelle, you just raised a really important question that I think should always be asked in processes because these big group meetings are uh, in intuitive for some people to participate in, um, whether verbally or in the chat, but there may be other barriers or reasons why some Chris members aren't coming um, or if they are coming, why they're not speaking up yeah. or, yeah. So, um, it, yeah, it does seem like now with the extension of another year is a chance to check in with all yeah. the members in some kind of um, way to, um, yeah, just to give us continued, I mean, that could happen at the meetings, but to continued QI type of feedback. Um, and it just is going to, it takes so much time to get, and I feel like we've done a lot of really incredible things, but to get um, people who have different slices of the pie to continue to see 
um, work together towards a whole is, is just really hard. And I think we've done a lot of great things intentionally. And I think we should just really think critically about what else we can do. So I'm hearing a suggestion, a specific suggestion of maybe having a, a midpoint check-in or a, a, a with each Chris member to find out what's working for them, what isn't, if they haven't been as engaged, what, what might be the barriers or what might change that, and then be open to some creative ways of engaging those folks that have been less engaged if, if we get some helpful feedback. Is that, am I hearing that right? Um, yep, I, 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 that's my sentiment. I don't want to be, I don't have prescriptive opinions on how that should happen at this point, but um, I think that would be a good, a good thing to do. Yeah, no, I, I love it. And I, I appreciate the specifics and um, thank you for that. Um, hand was up and then it went down. Did I miss somebody? Oh, oh, you know, I think it was Senator Dingra, but she might have to jump off for a moment. She's in transit right now, so she's participating via her phone. Um, let's see, I'm just going to check the chat here. Okay, Amber. Yeah, thanks. I guess I wanted to go back um, to something that Pasha raised early, um, which is this idea of meeting in person. Um, I do think there is some some significant value in that. And as people are talking and we're thinking about this, I do feel I'll speak, you know, just from my own experience, you know, I sit on the steering committee, Megan and I split responsibilities, you know, she sits on the Chris and I, in my role, feel like I would like to have a better touch point with Chris members individually in terms of what they're thinking, what their, what, you know, their ideas are, what their recommendations are. And, and so the idea of an in-person meeting, perhaps an extended one that would bring people together, have an opportunity, not only for just, not just a full day of presentations where everyone is talked at, but sort of breakout groups, opportunity to network, opportunity to discuss and have side conversations. I don't know. I mean, that, I mean, that would take some planning. It would take some resources and some other things, but I could see some real value in sort of maybe an almost like an annual convening of some kind where everyone gets together. And we, and it's really that sort of, opportunity because I I just I don't always feel that direct connection in terms of all the work because there's so many subcommittees in addition to the Chris and all these other side pieces and it's very hard not side pieces you know what I mean um but very hard for me you know to to make all those connections and maybe there's a way to to have all of us be together in that um in that sense so Amber just popping in to say that we are planning an in-person meeting of the Chris in September and what we might do then, based on your recommendation, is to think about an extension of that time and how we might take advantage of being in, in person together. So that's the first the first in-person opportunity that we're planning. And um, we're excited about that. So more, more to come there. That is very exciting. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. So thank you. Um, let me just check the chat here. And if I can just, if I can just make yeah, a, please, go ahead, yeah. uh, just a quick, if we haven't already, maybe again, you know, I can't, I can barely keep up with my calendar, but if we haven't already, I would definitely make sure we're getting invites out really early for that in-person meeting. So people can mark it off and make sure they can attend myself included. Excellent suggestion. And then I'm seeing in the chat, uh, echo from Bipasha, love the idea of commuting for longer than the three hours. Um, maybe even one two-day meeting. Of course, that's a lot of time and we'll need financial resources for many. So, um, you know, there's certainly those considerations, but I think there's some general enthusiasm for making opportunities for us to be together. And I will add just personally as a facilitator that um, now after three years of this under our belts and about a year and a half of doing some hybrid facilitation, there are good ways of convening and providing people who still don't, um, who, for whatever reason, can't be in person or would be traveling from a long way and, and, and can't make that happen to, to participate in a meaningful way. So I think there's, there's some good technology out there to support us in this. Other, so we've heard some really, I'm just going to recap here. We've heard some um, really good suggestions and some specifics from our steering committee members around um, again, being really clear in our, 
CRIS meetings about the process and and grounding us what the what the CRIS's role is, reminding everyone that this is about the ideas generation piece and not necessarily making decisions about which ideas are going to be carried forward. Um, doing some kind of uh, check in with CRIS members to understand where they're at and what the barriers might be for some of them to participation. Um, and then also being open to maybe some other strategies or tactics for engaging people who haven't been engaged. Um, looking at who has been missing, which voices have been missing, and doing a two-pronged approach of both filling any vacant seats um, and supporting HCA in doing that, since I understand certainly the seat we were just talking about, that's been a challenging one to fill. Uh, but also uh, simultaneously identifying and address, addressing barriers to, for other voices being coming to the table. And then I want to, um, and then also getting uh, in-person opportunity together and maybe extending that since some people will be coming from far away and we want to maximize that time. Um, Dr. Snow, I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier about um, how, and I'm not going to, put it in the words that you've I'm not gonna be able to say it as, as beautifully as you did, but you raised something about how um, in, in some of our discussions, some of the conversations we've had have impacted other Chris committee members and 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 we what we want to be doing is is encouraging people to talk and wrestle with tough ideas, but there can sometimes be moments where people walk away feeling, um, impacted. Oh, and I, I forgot to mention Dr. Stone's idea of ending the meeting with a reflection on on what the experience was and how how people were affected. Did you, um, Dr. Stone, did you have other thoughts in particular on how we, I think this is a really important theme here, how we bring difficult conversations to the table and 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 have them without um, stifling people's willingness to speak up or say say what they think. Yeah, I mean, I think we do a good job with time management and the planning. Um, there was an occasion where I think based on what I saw happen at one Chris meeting, uh, we were having a speaker do a presentation at a subsequent meeting. And I thought it was really important that that person have some context about the content that they were going to be speaking on and what we had already learned from the previous experience. And I think that's another thing we probably can think about doing. If we're having a person come into a presentation, especially if it's somebody that's not been a part of our process, uh, once we know what it is they're going to say, if we have reason to believe it's going to be misperceived or received in a hurtful way, we need to give that person the benefit of our knowledge so that it can be rethought in terms of how they present the material. Um, I'm one who's pretty famous for saying, I would much prefer people to just say what they're thinking and get it out than to withhold it. And I will deal with, if it didn't come out the right way, I, I can be pretty flexible about that, but I know not everybody is that way. And I think uh, we, we have been a part of this process for long enough that we do know something about the audience that we have convened. And so being able to sort of help people know um, the context that they're going to be saying something in, I think, is a way we can help them be more effective and have their words not immediately put people in a mode where the rest of what they say doesn't even get heard because they said something early on that didn't get heard the right way. I, I think part of that really is on us as the planners uh, to, to do a good job of preparing people and to know as best we can. And I think we looked at slides beforehand so we have as much info as we can on what somebody is likely going to be saying. Uh, but the next step is to give them every benefit of our experience to date so that their message can be heard in the best way. So if someone's coming in and they're speaking about a topic that we know um, can be very sensitive um, for some of our members and we can provide them with that context and, and also support them in honing their message so that the key things that they wanna get across are heard and not lost in 
in in the moment. Is that right? Okay. I think that's right. That's right. And I I sent an email to somebody trying to do just that thing. It, it wasn't public for everybody to know necessarily, but I think uh, that's something that we as the steering committee can think about in terms of consciously saying, once we know what somebody's going to say, how is this likely to be heard? And is there any advice we can give the presenter to have it go over in the way that we know they are intending it to be heard? Thank you, Dr. Snow. And I'm going to kind of flip that question and I'm, I'm going to be really, I'm going to try to be really careful how I ask this, but um, is, so there's, there's a, a responsibility that we have as planners to support people who are prevent, presenting material to make sure that it's, it's, it's heard the way they intended to. Do we, and do we have a response? And I don't mean this to be like a rhetorical or pre-answered question. Do we have a responsibility or is there a way in which we as steering committee members can also support people in hearing each other and getting past not getting past that's not fair but in 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 hearing even if something that someone said has has um deeply affected them is there a way that we can support them in 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 listening and hearing and seeking to understand I think we certainly can if they're able to let us know what they're feeling and, and experiencing. It's much harder if the person is silent. I, I mean, I may speculate, but I hate to try to assume what somebody is thinking or feeling. It's much easier if we created that space where people can really share honestly how things are being received. And I actually think that happens pretty well. I mean, I, I've been very impressed that uh, when there are things said that people really don't agree with in some of our discussions, uh, we don't have to work to generate that concern. People are pretty uh, free to say it. I think what we may need to do is then go back to the speaker or the presenter to say, well, how did you feel about the response that you got? I don't know that we closed that loop necessarily as well. But I've been very impressed that when people hear something that troubles them or that they're concerned about, uh, they tend to speak up. I, 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 I appreciate that. And I think, Dr. Snowden, that if we um, do what was suggested and do some kind of check-in with Chris committee members, if, if there have been moments where folks have felt like, I'm not going to say this because I don't, I don't feel comfortable saying it in a setting or whatever, that, that we can surface that. So, so I think we can uncover that at the same time. Thank you for, for sharing that. I'm just going to check the chat here. Um, okay. Other steering committee members thoughts here. Be Pasha. So talking about awkward feelings and not knowing what to do with that, I wanted to bring up an issue about people who leave the quiz committee and the process. So very early in the uh, process last year, one of our lived experience people, Kathy Callahan, who was appointed, left. And the, her reasons were, you know, she just had a lot going on in her life and couldn't give this process the time. So she stepped away. And uh, I've had a conversation with HMA, Betsy and Nicola. And the general rule of thumb was when people leave the space at the next Chris meeting, HMA announces, you know, this person has left, so we have an open position and we'll be filling it, you know, appropriately. Um, however, we've had two newer resignations. And I think rules of thumbs are important, but being able to actively and dynamically adapt to things is important too. And here's where it got awkward because um, as a steering committee member, I got information about those resignations. But then I wonder who is replying, and I brought all this up with uh, BHI and HMA, so who is responding to these emails? It is this email that comes in and there seems, from mine, this is again from my point of view, no one's responding. Now, I know there's a lot of always back conversations in the background going on that makes perfect sense. But it feels a little awkward to have an email sent to a larger group of people and there'd be absolutely no response to it. It's just odd as a person, as a human being, you know, when you don't hear back and forth, it makes you wonder what is happening. So one, I was wondering and I asked, 
who would who would be a person or the persons who would say at least we to uh, a reply all saying we got your message we will have a conversation with you you know further but we want to acknowledge we got this email and that I, I'm not saying the details have to be delved into in email and the back conversations, but just an acknowledge may make would make me feel like, oh, we acknowledge the email. There's conversations going on. I don't need to be involved. So that's one piece I was suggesting. The awkward thing was that there was no conversation. Um, one came to the steering, but the Chris didn't get it. And Here's the irony. I've started hearing from community members who are not on the Chris about these resignations. And I'm like, um, now what do I do? You know, so people are like, oh, I heard so-and-so left and, and I am trying to handle information because I value the process. So, you know, me, emails that come to steering, they are, can be publicly asked for, but still I'm like, I'm not gonna lie. I'm gonna say yes, and I'm not gonna go into the details. So. I think my opinion is that the Chris committee deserves, the committee at large deserves to know certain important things that maybe come to the steering and how do we um, convey, sorry, convey that information to them so it's not like we had no idea that this was happening. And I know some Chris members didn't know of the resignation, but community members that have nothing to do with the Chris knew about it. And so it was kind of awkward for me. And I just thought I'd bring it up. Thank you, Vipasha. So there's a couple of pieces in there that we can talk about. Um, one is, uh, Vipasha, I'm hearing you say it's important to be transparent from your perspective with the Chris about what's happening. A second is it would be really helpful to have some clarity or to agree on some clarity for how, for example, emails that are are addressed to a large group like the steering committee are how we coordinate response so that it's not just hanging there and also how we coordinate how we share this information with others since you as a steering committee member are considered kind of an authority and people are coming to you um, and then the third is is i'm hearing that even if there are uh emails that are sent privately to um to the folks that sent, for example, these resignation emails saying, thank you for letting us know and acknowledging it. When you don't know that that's happened, it, you, you have no idea, you know, th then you're left to think, well, what do, you know, what do I do now? Did I, did I catch all that? Yeah, I mean, two perspectives. From my perspective, having got the information, I'm like, who can I share it with? Who, who can I not? I'm talking about my lived experience uh, people, you know, the three other people on the Chris. And then there is, I, I'm thinking if I were on the Chris and not steering, let's say, and I got in, and I had no idea, and I heard from the community that, oh, do you know so-and-so's left? And I'd be like, I'm on the Chris. How, do we, how is it that I didn't know this? And so I think there's a sense of feeling like, are we being included? Do, uh, do we know, are we being informed of what's relevant to this whole process? So it might be a little disenfranchising to people and kind of go, well, nobody informs us about important things. I'm sure there are people on the Chris who are feeling that way. And um, so I just wanted to bring it up and say, we can have a conversation. I'd love to hear other people's inputs and reflections on this. Thanks, Bipasha. So steering committee, Bipasha has raised a few questions here um, that I think we can work together to, to articulate our process. Um, or what the process should be. So how do we, um, Bipasha is emphasizing that transparency with the Chris is important on matters like this. And also I think coordination um, so that you can both respond to emails that are addressed to the steering committee and also respond to questions that come to you when you're representing steering committee members. Any thoughts from steering committee on this one? Dr. Snowden. I could, or um, Dr. Snowden and then Michelle. Yeah, yeah. so I, I think my assumption is that when somebody sends an email to the full Chris, that that means everybody got it. I think the more awkward position is if something comes directly to the steering committee, but not to Chris. And I think there it is complicated because 
the person has made a choice and if they have chosen to not share something with the full Chris, I think we have to be careful about deciding that the needs of the Chris are now greater than that person's choice and decision. And so from that standpoint, I think I am more comfortable with the, a routine handling it so that we know that behind the scenes an email thanking the person for their participation and acknowledging receipt of the email takes place, but not going against the way they have chosen to communicating it and then making a more sort of routine announcement at the next meeting of the Chris as the way to inform the Chris. I think to me uh, that really, really does work. The other comment I would make is I do think that there are some parts of this process that are just awkward. And, um, this is one that I'm not sure there's a foolproof solution for, for all the instances that we will have to deal with, but it reminds me a little bit of the public comment period. And it took me a long time to sort of recognize the, the fact that we get public comment, but that we routinely don't respond to it makes sense and we have to let people know that when they're making their public comment that we're not responding but at the end of the day i think there really is a good rationale behind that and i think the same applies to being very careful about engaging in an email response to something um, where email may not really be the way we want to go with something so i'll, I'll stop there Okay, so a few things there, Dr. Stone. It sounds like um, the, because people are going to choose how they address these, and I, I got a, a, a note from another steering committee member um, noting that um, the emails, these, these specific resignation emails, some of them were sent to very specific people. Um, and so, so not even maybe not all of you, I don't, I have to go back and look, but not all of you necessarily received them at first. So it's not always clear who they're going to initially, but I'm understanding you say we need to be respectful of the intent of the person who sent it um, and maybe consider that in deciding what is shared more broadly. Um, and also that um, like public comment, this may not be the best forum for engaging in a deeper dialogue on some of the messages that might be in someone's um, email, meaning the, having an email exchange about it may not be the, the most productive. Um, Michelle, you were gonna jump in. Yeah, I haven't thought through all the points being raised here, but I did want to just um, echo that I do appreciate what Vipasha said about um, clarity on who's responding when an email comes to multiple of us on, um, on the steering committee. I think even Vipasha, you've emailed the steering committee some, and I think at times it's been like, whose job? Like, yeah, just how are we going to respond would be good to, to clarify, because I feel like, um, like even an acknowledgement and who should that be coming from would be great to figure out what our standard operating procedure is for that. And I'll put that back on the steering committee if you all have thoughts about how that can best be executed given that there are several of you on the committee. Um, let's discuss those. B. Pasha. I just wanted to clarify that I you know email is a terrible way to correspond, especially about difficult sensitive issues. So it is no intention of mine to have discussions about anything uh, in depth on email. It's just merely an acknowledgement of this email has been received and uh, you know, and we're acknowledging it and we will have ongoing conversations. Just, I think even that, um, I'll tell you something, we talk about the trauma-informed process. Trauma is not rape and being beaten up and starved. Sometimes when you don't know what the hell is going on as a kid, like your parents are you know, we uh, sometimes we watch shows and the kids go up to a parent and go, what's happening? And the parent goes, nothing, everything's fine. And I'm like, don't do that. Don't do that. <laughs> you know, that confuses kids. So it's just like, you know, yes, something is happening and, you know, addressing the concern and worry. And we're going to, we'll talk about it. It's a parallel process of, you know, like, hey, something is happening and we're going to deal with it. And that's it. And that's, you know, maybe let's say I'm playing the role of the child in this process. I'm like, okay, it's being taken care of. It's not my business. And I don't want to make it my business. Like a lot of kids just want to go out and play. They don't want to make their parents stuff their business. So 
So it was more the acknowledgement, not the in-depth discussions behind the scenes. That is absolutely not uh, part of an email process. Bipasha, there was a third piece you raised about transparency with the Chris, and I think that was um, somewhere where where Dr. Snowden offered maybe an alternative perspective on that. What did what did you what did you think there? Oh, I'm always learning from him. You know, <laughs> just the fact that someone chose a certain group of people versus another, and I think I will echo what Michelle said. It's a little confusing. You know, I don't look through every email to see who's on that list, but I hope someone is tracking that. And um, yes, if someone chooses to give this group the information versus that, uh, I can understand that, you know, if, if someone chose to send it to the steering, that was their choice. And I completely get honoring that choice. And it'd be brought up by the general process that Betsy, you know, explained to me as we bring it up at the next Chris thing. Now, it's more like this position is open and we're looking to fill it kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, I, I hear that. Um, I and I agree with uh, Dr. Snowden. There aren't any clear black and white answers, but if the intention is to try to be um, tuned in to people's emotional spaces, then that's the best we can do. So I think we're probably at a good place on this particular topic, which is I'm understanding uh, where um, the steering committee wants to be with this, which is having something some way of acknowledging um, and, and when it's addressed to multiple people knowing that it's being handled. So I think maybe this is something that we can work on providing some detail based on, on the direction we've received from the steering committee today and then and then um, share that back with everyone, get agreement and, and, and maybe update our charter. We have about three minutes left before we need to do action items and next steps and then move to public comment. I do have one person signed up for public comment. Um, any other thoughts or feedback um, on the questions that uh, how we can um, or what are some specific ways we can support the Chris in continuing to have these conversations and getting the voices at the table? Carrie, did you get anything back from your team or is that something we should follow up with um, with everyone at another point regarding um, the specific barriers to filling that seat and maybe the process for, for filling seats? Um, nothing about the specific barrier. We just had a, a statewide saying it out loud conference that is specific um, for uh, working with and and offering a conference for um, the LGBTQI plus community. And it was announced there and no one came forward to say that they wanted to be part of the Chris committee and the seat. And so we can ask, um, but thank you for giving me another opportunity, Jamie, to share. Um, yeah, the team is now announcing this at, at conferences. And so I think, however, we can still continue to get the word out, we will. Um, and we will start to look and maybe find out if there are some specific barriers that we can just raise up to folks and maybe we can find out how we can together as a team take those barriers down. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Carrie. And thanks to the HDA team for jumping on that in the background. So, um, all right. I think we'll close this out and move into action items and next steps. Chris committee or steering committee, thank you so much for um, bringing some thoughts and specifics there. We will, of course, summarize that in the, in the meeting summary and then talk about um, how we might implement these ideas that you've raised today. Um, in terms of action items and next steps, Nicola, did you have uh, take down any action items and next steps here that we should remind folks of? Jamie, I don't have a running list right okay. on me right here. No, I think I think that's right. I think we um, mostly it's we need to synthesize the ideas that came out of this that include um, grounding folks at Chris committee in what our role is, having um, seeing we can work into the agenda some kind of check in or reflection on our discussions, which I do want to acknowledge as your facilitator, our agendas it's it's always like shoehorning a lot of topics into a very short space. So I think we also have to recognize that. It's not, it's not necessarily easy to add, important, but not necessarily easy, easy to add anything to our agenda. Just putting that out there for everyone. 
um, continuing to explore and, and get moving the opportunity to be together in person, hopefully in September. Um, and uh, doing a check-in with Chris committee members. And then uh, if everyone can be on the lookout for um, how we might fill some of the vacant seats that we have on our Chris committee so we can continue to bring those voices to the table. And if you have perceptions or understandings of any barriers that we can clear out of the way, I think that would be really valued. Be Pasha. I I know if I type this to you, you wouldn't probably read it. I want to give you a big shout out for holding space. I really do. I think you do such a good job. This is my opinion, but you know, with all the agenda and fitting in and reflecting back to people, that takes a certain math skill set. So thank you, Jane. I just want to say that. that was very kind of you, Bipasha. Thank you for saying that. Um, okay. We have one person who has um indicated that they would like to make a public comment today. And um, I, I hope I hope I do say your name correctly. Um, Mame Baswa is going to um, offer a public comment. Bear with me just a second. I'm gonna put the timer up. And Mame, when you are ready. Um, oh, and I see one more person has also sent me a request, Krista Milhoffer. So we'll go with um, Mom, Mame Baswa first and then um, Krista Milhoffer. And just a reminder, and Dr. Snowden mentioned this as well, with our public comment, the steering committee is listening, but will not be responding to your comment. Uh, you will have two minutes to make your comment. I'll put the timer on the screen. Um, please do let me know ahead of time. I've already confirmed this with Mame, but um, Krista, please let me know if you need any accommodation, you need a little more time and we can accommodate that. Um, and now I am going to share the screen and Mame, when you're ready, um, please turn on your video camera and turn uh, turn on your mic and go ahead and speak. And um, I will start the timer. Oh, I'm actually having some, um, I'm, I may be cutting in and out with my voice. So yes, um, but yes, I just have a quick um, experience to share about um, the veteran crisis line. Um, I recently helped a veteran um, in a crisis situation, but they could not access 988. I wasn't for, sh for sure, um, exactly sure what was going on with their phone, um, but uh, they tried to um, download an, an alternative app, a phone call app, but they couldn't access 988. I shared this with a, um, a VA social worker, and they found this story kind of interesting because they've said that there have been accounts where um, there's either a particular phone plan somewhere that any time that um, veterans uh, try to call the uh, veteran crisis line, it cuts off. So I do not know whether or not that's a tech issue that can be addressed um, here or um, the veteran subcommittee, I mean, not the veteran subcommittee, but the tech subcommittee, or um, it has to go to the federal level. But this is an issue that's happening with that, um, the, the veterans crisis um, line with a particular, not with everyone, but this particular uh, subgroup that has a, um, um, with some folks who call that um, line. Um, another thing just to add, just hearing the subcommittee uh, talk is um, I'm just curious about the part of the Chris committee I was looking through. I think I saw one VA um, representative, but just would like to see maybe more of those voices and to acknowledge maybe that's probably um, something to address about the missing um, uh, voices that are not usually heard. So thank you. Thank you so much, Mame. And um, I'm about to send you a chat um, here, but I appreciate you making a comment today. Up next is Krista Milhoffer. And Krista, when you're ready, go ahead and turn on your video camera and your mic, and I will start the timer. Great. So my name is Krista Milhoffer. I'm the program administrator for People First of Washington. We're a self-advocacy organization made up of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we also support and provide technical assistance uh, to our statewide network 
to make sure they can be involved in different processes and spaces. So if you currently find yourself in a workplace that uh, works with our population and does not include them in any policy or uh, internal discussions and you want to change that, we are a resource uh, to you uh, for that work. Um, I'm excited about uh, 899. There's a couple of things, or 889, um, that I'd like you all to, to consider. Uh, I think it could be a really great tool. Um, one is the need for uh, customer satisfaction or feedback somehow to ensure that um, needs are being addressed and that the work of uh, is actually um, is being done well. I know there's a lot of data collection, but I think customer satisfaction should always be the first thing on all of our minds uh, to show that something is working. Uh, number two, the crisis teams. I want uh, to know if there's any conversation around access. Uh, we have lots of lists of resources, but when you call them, it doesn't mean that you're able to access them um, or get access to them. A good example is one of my staff experienced domestic violence and was offered to be institutionalized as opposed to um, being supported to stay in her home because of uh, there was no um, accessible resources uh, for mobility um, within our crisis system. Uh, there's lots of individual stories around that, but I think, you know, the crisis teams also need to be able to jump the line or have that ability to have the power to jump lines because we know that when resources are limited, everything's got a line and uh, that doesn't work well for crisis stabilization. And the last part is uh, sustainability of system improvement. You are all very busy and there will be new laws and new things that will take up your time. So what is gonna happen for sustainability and ongoing improvement metrics to ensure that that continues when um, the work of the Chris team is, is done and there's new things that come up because right now it's great. There's so much attention on this for the launch, um, but in terms of it providing that um, real self-improvement um, and being able to, to get your attention and to, to continually be something that improves, um, I really hope that that's a part of the things that you consider too through implementation. So um, that's what I have for my notes. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Krista. And um, if uh, both folks who provide public comment today would be willing to email your remarks um, to the HCA or the HCA email address where we collect our email. I'm just multitasking here. I'll put that in the chat so you have access to it. That'll just help us make sure that we get all of your comments down. Okay, that email is in the chat. All right, that is it for our public comment today. I have not received any other comment requests. So um, steering committee members, thank you so much for your um, engagement and participation today. Um, a big thank you to our ASL interpreters, um, Charlotte and Paula, and um, an especially big thank you to our community members who um, put in the time to participate in these processes, most especially our members with lived experience. Um, who have been so instrumental in, in moving this process forward and grounding us in our work. And with that, uh, I encourage uh, all of you to look out for information about the next CRISP meeting on Tuesday, June 20th, two weeks from now. We're going to go back and revisit uh, the root cause analysis that we did at our May meeting and start digging into um, some recommendations for filling those gaps. In the meantime, I wish you all good health, enjoy the sunshine, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you soon. Take care, everybody.